Hello and welcome to back to Pathways to Progress. I'm your fill-in host for the evening, Will and Edgar. Lisa Savage sends her regards. She couldn't make it tonight. But I am back, of course, with our wonderful city councilors, Roberto Rodriguez, Victoria Pelletier. Guys, how's it been? It's been a little bit, but we're back. How goes it? Yeah, it feels like a short break from the last show. But um, in the world of council, um, it, it feels like it, we're kind of like at a pivot point after maybe like a quiet period and about to take on a lot of work. Uh, but it's going well. Excited to be back here and um, really glad to see Tori once again. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, our last meeting was really short, too. It was like, was it an hour? It was like maybe 45 minutes. It was really quick. And so that, I think, was maybe the last like short meeting that we're going to have because now we're getting into the budget and now we're getting to like very, very dense long meetings. So it was nice to have like a quick 45 minute one, a couple agenda items. And now, yeah, we're certainly going to get back into the swing of things in, in spring. Yeah, no, I mean, you guys, before the show, we're talking about you've got a lot coming up. And actually, for anyone wanting to stream the city council meetings, you can actually stream them. PMCwatch.com, they're on Channel 5. You can watch them all in their entirety so you can see every moment. <laughs> if, you, if, if you're not sick of them yet, you can watch even more of them. Um, no, no one would ever be sick of the two of you. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you guys... <laughs> but, you know, you guys were talking about there's a lot going on. So what can the people of Portland expect is happening in, a, in the city council? Yeah, so like in the like very immediate future and Monday evening, we're going to have a workshop where um, we're going to we're giving ca uh, guidance to the city manager of on the budget of what tax increase um, we feel is appropriate. So, you know, that's given on a percentage. Um, and you know you, you're considering a wide range, right? Like if you look into inflation, you can think of like upwards of like seven, eight percent increases to match what's happened with inflation. And then when you think about you know uh, sustainability and what how it affects people's finances and you know how it trickles down to the cost of living, you know you want to also not be you know thoughtless about it. So we'll see what range we all land on. Um, to me, you know the the guidance of the tax increase is one thing, but you know what's included in the budget is what's important, right? So we've I, we've already spoken of what our goals are as a council, right? So we want to make sure that we're addressing housing, that public service or health services, public health services for homeless folks, um, and climate change are like the top priorities that we've identified. So when I look at the budget, and if we have to consider like cuts or or, or, or you know like reductions in spending, you know. We need to look at things and programs that are associated, that are advancing those specific goals. And then everything else, really, we need to have a discussion about because that tax increase needs to be, you know, we can't, you know, we can't go bankrupt in the city. We can't kick people out or, or force people out because the cost of living is, is uncontrollable. But at the same time, we have a, a responsibility to provide services. So again, what's included in that budget is what's important to me, and that's going to be a big discussion uh, on Monday night. I, that's, I think that's the biggest thing. There's a lot more going on, but maybe Tori wants to talk about the budget piece. Well, yeah, the budget part is hard. This is our second time now doing it, so it's a little bit um, more familiar than it was last year. But I think the hard part is it, it's really a balancing act because nobody wants their property taxes to go up. And then rent, I'm a renter. Nobody wants their rent to, go, to subsequently go up. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're aligning ourselves with our goals. And I always thought it was interesting that we do our goal setting prior to the budget because we'll do our goal setting. We're getting really excited. Here's all the stuff we want to do. And then come time for the budget conversation, it's a little bit like, OK, so let's <laughs> let's revisit what we can actually do and what yeah. we can afford. Um, but, yeah, I want to make sure, like like Roberto said, that we're staying in line with our goals of housing, with our goals of climate, with our goals of racial equity um, and with our goals of social services and ensuring that we are you know, providing as many resources for Portland as we can. So it's like definitely a balancing act. And I really encourage everyone to come to those meetings and even the workshop. Um, public comment is not taken at workshops, but it's still a great way for us to be able to ask questions in like a very informal format. Um, and it's a process. And I think it's really important for people to follow along so that when there is time for public comment, that they're prepared to share with us what they think. Yeah, and to, 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 to the point about taxes, you know, as you said, a lot of people, they were concerned about, you know, is my property tax going to go yeah. up? You know, how much am I paying? W one question Portlanders might be asking is, well, what would my tax dollars be going to? What are these new programs that you guys are hoping to, uh, to get into this new budget? So there's a few things that we are, like, obligated to include in this budget that passed on referendum last November. So there are some costs associated with implementing the Clean Elections um, Act. And there are also some costs associated with the rental um, uh, ordinance that passed. 
Um, so those things we already know have to be part of it. Um, I think that outside of that, we, we really just have, um, you know, an increased demand on the uh, health, public health services department. So we know that last year there was a huge increase in spending there. We anticipate that there'll be a, an equal demand there. There are vacancies in many departments, so there is still, um, you know, new, uh, new assessments of like how much staffing is needed. And I think there'll be some requests from departments to increase capacity. So there'll be some requests to have more staffing, I believe, in permitting and licensing department. That's one area that we feel um, is lacking, you know, in, in terms of what we can do to facilitate new development, right, of housing. And if the process of getting permitting and license is kind of stopping the, the floodgate, you know, allowing capacity there or building capacity there should help. So that's just one, one thought of what we might be looking at. Um, there's also going to be, I understand, a conversation um, about the Barron Center. You know, the Barron Center is a, um, a skilled nursing facility that's ran by the city of Portland. It is almost unheard of at this day and age of a municipality that runs a facility like that. That's a really antiquated system. So it's it, not to say that we shouldn't be doing it, but it, the reason that municipalities don't do it is because it's super expensive. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult or, or, uh, operation to run, you know, with, especially in the healthcare environment today. Um, and so we're gonna have a discussion about the structure of that, of that department and you know, how does it impact our, our uh, budget and certainly how does it advance our goals. Um, that's a really actually, the, we can go, I don't wanna get too deep into the weeds of that, but you know, a couple of weeks ago I got to tour um, the main med emergency department after, to learn more about their challenges that they're facing because of the lack of um, uh, skilled nursing beds and short stay beds in facilities um, throughout the region and in Maine. So the hospital is unable to discharge patients out of there into these facilities that is where they really are more, the, the, the care that they need is really where they're gonna best be able to get it. Um, so these patients often end up staying in the hallway at Maine Med or just taking up rooms that are not, again, you know, the best or more conducive to their health. So um, the way that the uh, Barron Center interacts with that, I think is a big conversation that affects the entirety of the system um, that we're trying to influence. So again, uh, this, uh, I think that's gonna be a big piece of the conversation as well. And yeah, I think those are the bigger highlights, but there, I guess to, another part of, to, I'm talking a lot, huh? <laughs> another <laughs> part. <laughs> Last episode it was Last Victoria, now it's, attention, it's you now it's Roberta, that's right. I won't, I won't, I won't say this much money. <laughs> and, um, you know, to, to another part to answer your, your question about what's going to be added, I, I don't think that this is a year where we're like really adding a lot of like, you know, new programming. Um, I don't think that that's where, even if we did, there isn't the enough capacity or staff to run things very well. So to add new programming without necessarily assuring that things are going to run smoothly is, is irresponsible and, and not good spending. So um, as, as we look at the budget, I wouldn't, I want people to know that this is a year of us being really thoughtful about, and the, the council started to have a conversation about what are core services in this city? And what is it that we absolutely need and are legally obligated to provide? Plus what is it, you know, legacy spending is what I refer to it. Things that we've done because we've always done them, but they're not necessarily advancing our goals of improving, you know, conditions for homeless people, advancing climate change policies, or creating housing opportunities. So those legacy programs are the ones that I think we need to have a discussion about you know, do we want to continue to spend here? And is that what taxpayers are expecting their tax increases to um, advance? Or do they want, do they agree on the goals that the council has stated? Um, again, a, a deep conversation that the council should embrace, should embrace on Monday. Do you have anything to add on to that? I mean, just, that was great. Know. I don't know that I have a lot to add. <laughs> I was just nodding along. Yeah, I, I, you know, the only thing that I'll say is I think we all had, this is the time where I think on the council it's really interesting because I think we all are trying to move in the same direction of advancing our goals, but we have different ways of getting there. And so this will be, I think, an interesting conversation about seeing where the balancing act is. And then also reminding me, because we were, you know, we talk about this all the time, but yeah, the city is significantly understaffed. I think like at our, at the state of the city, there was something like 200, over 200 vacancies. I'm not sure how many there are now, but that's really challenging as well because we're, I feel like we're working a little bit at a deficit. We have all of these things that we're really excited to implement, but if we don't have staff to really, you know, advance a lot of the things that we want to do, um, it's going to be challenging for us. So 
you know, I'm, I'm excited to see where we land um, and making sure that we're keeping in mind the goals that, that we have and, and the goals that we really solidified in December and doing what we can to move those forward. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And then, you know, on top of that, city manager switch is coming to a head. Yeah. That's, you guys are holding a, a session to decide or you have resumes I hear that you're looking at. So we, there's a, there's a hiring committee that yeah. has been really kind of like um, overseeing the work primarily, right? Now, all of us have been able to like dive into different aspects of the work, but we are, they, so they, they were in charge of hiring the search firm that helped us with the search, putting together the job description, the posting, getting feedback, and ultimately putting it out there. So we, that posting was out. We had the, the candidates uh, that uh, applied, and now we have like the top 12 yeah. resumes and cover letters that have been given to us along with the recording of their interviews for us to review. Mm -hmm. And over the next month, we're going to have an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one interviews, the counselor as well, with who we decide are our top three candidates. Mm -hmm. And um, they'll be coming in town. They'll have a tour of the city. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a conversation that will be happening shortly about, you know, what that tour should be, right? Like when a candidate comes into Portland, what are the key parts of the city that we want to make sure that they are, um, you know, presented? And um, I, I think we'll do some sort of loop around the city and try to hit on some of the major um, aspects of it. Um, you gotta make sure to bring him here. Yeah, PNC. yeah. I really like. Can't wait to take him to Parkside to my neighborhood. <laughs> so I yeah. feel like. I, I absolutely. <laughs> I think. I mean. I think that there's. I've already heard so many ideas. My my first um, suggestion when we uh, when we were at the hiring committee, I just said just make sure that he goes to the homeless services center. Yeah. You know, like that's yeah. got to be one of the official stops. Yeah. And he's got to stop by all the all the public health services um, offices and literally get off the van and walk it mm -hmm. and see the tour. You know, firsthand. And then maybe. Maybe if there's time, we'll stop for like lobster roll or something. <laughs> but you know, let, let's stick to the yeah. priorities of like, if you want this job, you know, you these are the, these these are the, the the people and the work that we are prioritizing. These are the staff members that we want to listen to, and this these are the, the 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 programs and the services that we think are, are most critical right now. And you know, I think that would be really telling of what a candidate thinks when they when they see that aspect of Portland, um, or when they see the city from the operational side of it. You know. Um, so anyway, so that's really exciting. I've, yeah. I'm in, just as a side note, in, in, you know, we're also hiring a police chief. Mm. Um, the superintendent search is happening parallel to this. We're not necessarily involved in that, but clearly we're partners, so we, we, we have a say in that. Um, and on my personal life, um, my, the organization that I work, that I've been doing interim executive director work, cultivating community, we, we just hired a new director, so I'll be finally stepping down from there. So anyways, there are all wow. these hires <laughs> yeah. that are happening, know. you know, all over the place. And I'm, I've been really spending a lot of time thinking, and we, other than that, we've also had staff hires. So I've yeah. just been thinking really strategically about what that candidate assessment process looks like, what the interview process looks like, what questions should be asked, and how to assess a candidate, and, um, and also how to assess an organization as they're pivoting in, in a transition, right? Like, I've been in an interim role at the Cultivating Community, now we're pivoting into a long-term. We've had an interim city manager, and now we're pivoting into a long-term commitment. And you know, we have an interim superintendent, interim police, so this entire city is yeah. really in this transitional period, and, and we, we, I believe, should be looking towards stability over the, over the next several years. And so these, these hires, these decisions that we're making, these budgets, we all need to think of them as this big organization, this big operational thing that's happening. And, and how all these moving pieces, can we, can we line them up so we get key people to advance the goals that we've all ran on these, on, you know, on, on these agendas to, to advance, right? The key issues of equity, racial equity, social equity, and, and justice, and put the right people in the key positions to advance yeah. them. You know, I, I, I think it's a, I'm immensely lucky to be here in this position at this time. And I think it, the city is is prime for like to pivot into a new direction, and and doesn't necessarily have to be a different direction, but certainly something new. So Victoria, I want to ask you from what I just heard from him, new police chief, mm -hmm. you know, and we know, you know <laughs> the Black Lives Matter movement. We've mm -hmm. seen you know police brutality and yeah. and and you know how leadership and 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 in, in it and training, you know, that doesn't address you know racial justice. What's what would you want to see in a police chief mm. to to head up Portland? That's a, that's a tough question for me to answer. I actually did have, um, I was supposed to meet with them. I think we all were, or maybe meet with the search committee, I think, at one point. I, it hasn't happened for me yet. But 
I mean, I don't know. We I think it's we have to really take a look at at policing and the institution of policing. And I think it's really important that if we are moving forward with the, with the path of like keeping a police institution here in Portland, that we are having really transparent conversations about the history of policing in this country and not really saying like Portland is exempt from the things that have been happening all over the country um, or acting like, you know, Portland doesn't have the same racial issues that other places have because we very much do. And so, you know, I, I, I hope that if we are going to move forward with keeping this institution within the city, that whoever is hired is open to having those conversations and really understanding the role and the power dynamic that they have and the history of the institution and how much damage has continued to be done to marginalized communities from this institution um, and coming into it ready and open to, to have that discussion. You know, you know what would be really, as I'm listening to you and I'm picturing like literally having an interview with the candidates and like sliding over the the press release from the Portland Police Department yeah. from last month and just asking them to read it and react. And right. just sit there and see, right. do they get that exceptionalism and that, that messaging and do they get how hurtful that is and how ignorant that is? Yeah. And that to me, that's like the most basic kind of like oh, yeah. bar that I need them Absolutely. to be at. And, and it speaks like, exactly to what Tori was saying. Yeah, I think we, we, we do that a lot here in Portland of being like, we're not like other cities. And in, in certain ways, we are different than other cities. But with racial issues, it's an, it's an insult to say that we're not like that, especially, you know, given some of our more recent events. And so I, I, I really think that I, I, whoever is going to be hired is, just has to be willing to have that conversation and has to be willing to look at how policing has been done and think about ways that they could do it differently. Yeah. So. We'll, well see. no, because you know it's 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 one thing about messaging. It's another thing. You need someone to come in and and enact the, the right policies that yeah. are fair, that are just, that are equitable, mm -hmm. and also you know you know create training and 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 policies that will that will educate police officers and will train them accordingly to the issues that that black and brown and Hispanic people have been facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's. You know, but yeah. you you mentioned something about racial equity. City of Portland is going down that road, as are most organizations and governments today. Talk a little bit about you know what the uh, what the plan is there. So there's a new uh, hire, a new position that was filled of a racial equity and justice director, um, and that's a position that was funded through last year's budget and is a result of one of the recommendations from the racial equity steering committee that was in place after, uh, they were in place from 2020 through 2021. So their final report had that recommendation. So um, that was, that, like I said, that was uh, put through the budget last year. We, there was a bit of like uncertainty at one point about when the hire was actually gonna take place, um, even after it had been funded, but um, it kind of got advanced, somewhat um, fast-tracked a couple of months ago and a new person was hired and announced and it was a press release sent out by the city a couple of weeks ago. So we have them coming on and it, I think it's gonna be exciting to see how that department kind of shapes itself and the role that they play in assisting both the, the city manager and staff and the council in you know, addressing or assessing you know, equitable outcomes of our decision making, right? I think that for me, at the end of the day, like your outcomes is what determines whether you are, you know, very much like uh, like Ibram Kendi says, right? Like if your outcomes are equitable or inequitable, then you have a, your racist policies, right? If you can measure the outcomes and not find equitable or not find inequities, then you can start to say that you're an anti-racist organization. But if your outcomes is what measures. So in this city, you know, you can just walk out the door and you can tell that there's inequity, right? Yeah. So we can tell that the policies and the, and the ordinances in the city are by no means anti-racist because we're creating inequities. And again, inequities that could be measured through you know, racial distinguishing um, factors and, and demographics. So I, I, to me, what that department is gonna help us do is advance policies that have outcomes that don't produce inequities. Yeah, what I'm really hopeful for, um, well, not hopeful for it because it's, it's done. So at our, at our inauguration, I um, sponsored a resolution to create a racial equity committee that will support this department and will support um, this new hire. So now that this person has been hired, and I'm not sure like how long it will take for us to solidify a committee of counselors that will support that work. But I'm really excited for that. And I think that that's, a, that's another exciting part of us being on the council, of just getting to experience that. This is the city's first ever, um, what I think, justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion manager that they have ever had. 
And so I, I'm really looking forward to this individual and this department being able to advance a lot of the work that was done by the Racial Equity Steering Committee in 2020. Um, and also just being able to say, you know, we're in a city that is rapidly diversifying. We're in a city that speaks seven major languages. I think it's really important for people to feel comfortable that there is someone at City Hall that is advancing racial equity and is advancing the interests of marginalized individuals here. So I, I think it's really cool and I look forward to meeting this new person, um, welcoming them to Maine and to Portland and just really creating a, a good working relationship with them so that we can support their, their work. Yeah, no. I mean, you know, in, and uh, you, you, you've said it in the past, you know, we're a, we're a small town that became a big town. And we have all these big town problems, you know, and that, of course, is going to weigh into the people that we hire to to create policies to advise us. Superintendent, you know, you're on the school board. What would you like to see in a in a possible superintendent or candidate, at least? Yeah, I mean, I think like besides like uh, you know policy driven stuff, I think number one, you want somebody that's committed to be here for a long period of time. Like you, you don't want somebody to use this as a career stepping stone. Um, because transition at the superintendent or transition in the leadership position of any organization is really detrimental to advancing big strategic goals, right? So if we really care about continuing to advance <clears throat> equity in public schools, you know, we want to have a leader that's committed to being here in the long term. So that, that's the, one of the key factors. Um, as far as like their, their, their ideology, so to speak, or what they, what they come with, um, I think today the, the, the vast majority of candidates that are going to be applying for superintendent positions understand that advancing equity, is particularly if you apply to, to a place like Poland, is, is part of what, what the ask is. So for us, um, I think we just need to identify those that agree on what equity even means. Right? Like Poland Public Schools actually has a policy that defines equity for the purposes of decision making for the school board. And that, that policy took over a year to develop and it included input from everyone in the community um, outside of the schools too. Again, so that we can have a guiding, a guiding document. So when you're looking at candidates and you look at your policy that defines equity, you should be able to identify whether that candidate agrees with your view of it as, uh, as, you, as you fit it into your strategic plan. Um, to me, you know, as far as you mentioned the size of the district, the proportion of the district, this is the largest school district in the state of Maine, it's the most diverse. There are over 60 languages spoken in the homes of our students, so, you know, ELL students um, are a huge portion of our, of our school's um, enrollment. And so I think that we need a, a, a superintendent that comes with a background that understands that environment, right? A, a school that maybe comes from a school district that also has a strong diversity in language spoken. And also, what is their philosophy into, you know, second language education? You know, we, you know, I'm, I'm a second language speaker, right? I remember in my, in my generation, it was like you used to be like, you know, speaking Spanish, you used to be like embarrassed of it. Like you used to be pressured to like learn English and it like you were, it's like that colonizer mentality where you're like, you know, forget your, your heritage. And now we want to support the development of English language acquisition while embracing your native language because your home language and culture is literally what we've been claiming all along is brings the value to our community. So here we are telling you like, forget that and learn English. No. So we, as we think of acculturation and assimilation and how our students in, interact with our school district, you know, we need a superintendent that understands how that plays and that philosophy fills into our system. Um, to me, those are key things. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll say that those are the things that I found Superintendent Javier Botana was fucking amazing at. You know, like he, he gets it, you know. He said, let me just say this, you know, like, he was a Peter Pan immigrant. You know what that is? Those are kids that from Cuba whose parents were just sending them out of the country yeah. during the Castro regime because they, they needed them out of there. So he and his little brother went over to Spain and they were there on their own until their parents eventually left Cuba and then they reunited in the States, eventually grew up you know, as an immigrant family, non-English non -English speakers, eventually coming up. And look at him, man. He ended up being the superintendent of a school district in the largest you know, school district in the state of Maine yeah. and being incredibly successful. You know, like that story, that content, that experience, I'd love to get a candidate and, you know, through the door that, that brings that with them. And then ask him, how do you see equity in education? How do you see policy? And have that, I just love the opportunity to have a conversation with someone like that. You know? I mean, ha you know, as you said, Superintendent Botana, he was Cuban, you know. He understood that struggle. He understood coming from, 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 from only knowing one language and the struggles of trying to learn English and, and the system in place. 
would it be helpful at all to, and I'm not saying you know solely look for people, but would it be helpful to look for someone who is Hispanic, who is black and brown, or who is indigenous even, or who, who comes from a background that understands you know, what you've been talking about? Yeah. Man, I'll tell you this. I, um, I'll tell you, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll tell you my personal opinion after I say what I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a story. I was, when Superintendent Botan and I, when I was chair, we were, we were reaching out to HBCUs throughout the country because we wanted to connect our students with pathways towards HBCUs. And that's something that had not happened in Palm Pro schools. And so we invited some folks over from Clark um, University, and I forgot what the other school was over in, in, in Georgia as well. And um, we, they toured the schools, they met the students, it was really great. And then in that evening, Javier and I took them out to dinner. So we were out here at uh, one of the local restaurants over near Monument Square, and we were having a great time. And these two gentlemen, these two black gentlemen were, were just blown away. They said, we knew we were coming to Maine to meet the chair and the superintendent of the school district. We never thought we were gonna meet this Puerto Rican dude and this Cuban guy. Like they were blown away and they were just like, and your school and everything that you guys are talking about, equity and the way that you're supporting your, like they were just so impressed by it. Like that, yeah. that and, and that immediately translates to our students having more opportunities you know, post -second, for post-secondary success. So that value, not for nothing, but like you can't replace it. Like that's, that's something that our experiences brought to the table. So yes, I think that there's value there. But look at what we have to endure. And look at what like, like, and look, I always want to like give the opportunity, but I want to be really fair. Like, I'm asking you to step into an arena that you're going to be exposed to, you know, racism, like blatantly, like just blatantly like racist people. You're going to hate and, and the pushback when you try to advance justice and do righteous work amongst a predominantly white you know, society is hard. You know what I mean? So I fundamentally think that, and, I, and this is going to sound really weird given the, the work that I've done, I fundamentally think that we need to focus on our own communities and that while this is a diverse community, it ain't my community. Like I don't live in community with Puerto Ricans in Portland. You know? And when I talk about my community, that's who I think about. Now, when I talk about the community in which I inhibit and that I have to, like, my kids go to school in and mm -hmm. that I work and that I employ people at, you know, then I think more broadly. And when I think about my public service, I think very broadly. But when I think about if I'm a candidate for a superintendent, I'd want them to, like, brother, there's an opening over there at the HBCU. Bobby, there's an opening at the Universidad de Puerto Rico. Like, go out there, you know? So that's the complexity with which I approach it. And that's, that's the way I'm not going to answer your question. All right. well, I, <laughs> I love think, that. well, I, I, we, we'd love to keep talking, but sadly, we are almost out of time. Guys, thank you so much for coming on. Next, next month, we hope to have Lisa back. Okay, well, you were great. You so, were right. say, you're the new fill in if she can't make it. So, oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> done. <laughs> no, but no, guys, thank you again you know, for sharing your, your thoughts and, and all this, informing the people of Portland, you know, what's going on in our city council. You know, people love transparency and having you guys on like this and talking about that, I think is really awesome. Um, do you guys ever get people coming up and going, hey, I saw you on uh, Pathways, I love you. Uh... I mean, I did get an email that's from someone that said, I saw you and I didn't vote for you because <laughs> I didn't like you, but I watched your episode and I like you and keep doing what you're Look doing. Look at that. So I'm just saying this show is changing people's opinions. That's, that's what we love to hear here. One vote at a time. Yeah, no, yeah, no. <laughs> and of course, guys, as I said, you know, you can stream city council meetings on PMC, pmcwatch.com. And you can stream all these episodes, all these shows on pmcwatch.com. Go back to the back catalog, check out the older episodes, see how we progressed over the years. And the podcast. <laughs> and the podcast yes. Spotify and Apple Podcasts, of course, we're on those too. But guys, thank you so much for being on. Thank and you. guys, once again, of course, you can watch uh, all the episodes of Pathways to Progress, including our shows in our back catalog at pmcwatch.com. You can, of course, stream on pmcwatch.com, watch on Channel 5. You can listen, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Pathways to Progress. But guys, uh, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.